this is a little exciting uh, in that our talk um, touches on, I'm not sure if it pulls together, um, many of the themes that have been coming up um, all day and all afternoon. So hopefully you'll see some connections there. I don't know if we have uh, answers to offer so much as further issues to consider. Um, what Alex and I want to do here today is um, talk about what are the ways that uh, nanotechnology can pen potentially impact uh, society um, in ways that aren't necessarily about health and environmental safety, but are much more subtle uh, and much more insidious, perhaps, for those reasons. And we do this by focusing on a case study, um, research that's taking place right now at the University of Washington uh, with Barbeck Parvez. Uh, on developing uh, bionic contact lenses. What makes them nanotech is the um, uh, technology that goes into creating and making these lenses. And the idea is that uh, eventually we'll be able to put little LCDs on these lenses, uh, some sort of radio transmitter uh, so that we can communicate back and forth, um, and even have some sort of uh, health uh, mentoring devices. So from here, we can imagine all sorts of um, implications and uses. Uh, the idea is now we've got some concrete case in mind, a specific new technique of, of making these contact lenses, um, but then we can let our imaginations wander to figure out what kinds of uh, uses this could have. Uh, navigation, someone mentioned earlier, a, a fancy iPod that's much closer and harder to take off, take off um, or also health monitoring. Um, but what Alex and I want to suggest here is that as we let ourselves brainstorm and think about how these technologies can serve our needs, it's important to remember at the same time, at a certain point, these technologies, once they get implemented in society, will force us to serve them. Uh, we will have to respond to them whether we want to or not. So here's an example. Um, suppose you've got someone who never owned a cell phone, never opted into that system. Nonetheless, you're walking around, you encounter a total stranger. I don't know how often this happens to you. It happens to me maybe once a week. Uh, someone starts talking to you, engage in a conversation with them, only to find out they're not talking to you. They're talking on the phone, and they didn't even notice you were there. So this is a rather benign way that these changing systems can affect you, uh, but nonetheless, uh, I think it serves the example. There are much more um, famous examples. Uh, we've heard some of them today, but what we want to point out um, is that while cars, cell phones, all of these uh, technological changes have forced adaptation, we really want to focus not necessarily on the spectacular, the dangerous, the sudden um, changes, but the slow ones, the ones we don't realize. So, um, so for example, with cars, sure, certainly we do need to think about accidents, this is what we heard before, but also even how uh, having the car system and the highway system can cut down on our choices. So it, if someone might say, oh, I really wish that I didn't have to drive. I really wish that I could just get up in the morning and walk to school, walk to work. And that's simply not feasible in a way that it might actually have been feasible 100 years ago. You simply can't get there because we've built our cities and, uh, and our housing so far apart. Uh, and literally, if you did want it, if you did decide to walk, there isn't necessarily a path for you to take. There's a road in the way. It's not safe for you to go in that direction. Uh, and at the same time with cell phones, as they become uh, uh, more available and, and more use, uh, there are these other consequences. If you don't have one, it's harder and harder to find a payphone. So certain systems that we were relying on before disappear. So you have to, you're forced to adapt in a lot of these cases, whether you want to or not. And so this is, these are supposed to be examples where the technology influences us and we end up serving it or responding to it instead of using it to achieve our own goals. So we're thinking about uh, we're thinking about nanotechnology in this regard, insofar as uh, many uh, many high impact technologies, technologies that use every day, force this kind of adaptation that we're talking about. Nanotechnology seems to have that potential. Uh, in in particular, this uh, bio bio contact lens that we're talking about has that potential to be used every day, uh, and therefore it's simply something that we should be considering will possibly in the future force these kinds of adaptations that we're concerned about. Uh, our, 
I, I want to pause here just to note that um, there's been a concern about how much we can foresee these changes. How much can we look ahead and see what kinds of technological systems uh, we're going to be embedded into. Um, and uh, I don't know that I have too much of an answer to that, but I think Alex and I have, have talked a lot about how it's really important that we do it now. Um, we could talk later of whether that's even possible and what that means. But what I want to offer you are two reasons why, why this is an urgent um, question that can't just, we can't just wait and see what's going to happen. So uh, to do that, it's helpful to have this notion of technological systems that we referred to uh, earlier. Uh, Thomas Hughes presents this in a really nice way, and he uses the example of a ship. You might have a new technology, which is uh, transatlantic shipping. And part of that system isn't just the boat and the sailors on it, but also the timber industry that you use to get the raw materials to build that ship, the merchants who place their goods on that ship as it crosses the Atlantic, uh, and the monarchies that pay for it. So the system, uh, the technological system, can uh, really reach far out into a lot of different sectors of society, uh, even though uh, we're just supposedly just talking about the one object. And the same thing happens here for the biotic contact lenses. Uh, even though they're very small, they're not nanoscale, but they're still quite small. Uh, physically, the system for the lens goes beyond just what you put in your eye. It goes into the radio transmitter on your belt. It goes to the, uh, the frequency tower that you can use to communicate from your biotic lenses to other people, and then there's whatever information other people choose to send to that tower. So even uh, in this case, there is um, a huge infrastructure that's required to get the technology to work, and therefore has the potential to influence in a lot of different uh, situations. So as we think about what these influences might be as we brainstorm, we can come up with a lot of uh, very, very positive um, potential applications, and these are the ones that you tend to see in the grant writing and in the literature. Uh, the top one for this one in particular being the potential for medical monitoring, since the contact lens is, is right there uh, in contact with your eye. Um, there's a huge potential to put all sorts of health monitoring systems on there for diabetics and so forth, um, and then can serve as emergency alerts. There are also potential negative uh, uses. Uh, I'm sure we don't really relish the thought of telemarketers being able to access us in this very personal way without our control. Um, so we can imagine positive and negative changes, or there just might simply be changes that uh, are positive or negative or, ne or neutral. Um, if we really do have these, uh, these new lenses uh, as ubiquitous as they might become, it would make closed book exams impossible. There would be no way to check and make sure that the students are cheating. And so that would have some um, unintended effect. We'd have to really change and transform the way that we conduct exams. That might be perfectly fine. That might not be a problem. And yet it's still a change. What I want to um, touch on here to respond to some of the comments that have been made earlier is that um, it, to some degree, it's true, we can't really foresee and anticipate exactly what these changes are going to be. But to another degree, uh, a lot of these are um, put forward by agents. Someone decides. Someone goes for it and said, I'm going to construct spam that I'm going to send to you. I'm going to choose to do this. Uh, and so what we're proposing here is that um, there's an opportunity at this point in time, before they've been created, to think about what we want those changes to be. There's this real sense, when I first entered this class on nanotechnology, um, talking to other people and reading the literature, there's this sense of inevitability about it. It's just going to happen. It's just going to take off. There are going to be these changes. There's going to be an atomic bomb. There's nothing you can do about it. And what we're attempting to do is to put agency back into this process. And it really has to happen at this point. Um, before too much has, has gone on. And so let me suggest what that might look like. Uh, for me, a success case, if that's debatable, um, are physical precautions that have been um, implemented into DVD players, so personal um, video players in the home. So there's this, uh, there was a decision made to create a system for playing back videos in, in Asia that is incompatible with the system in the United States. And the idea there being it would uh, at least slow down the piracy in the black market so that you can't buy cheap CDs in Asia and just ship them to the United States. 
Um, I want to hazard that it's had at least some success. <laughs> we can debate about that. <laughs> Certainly there are, at the very least, it's changed and shaped the, form, the particular form that piracy has right now. Uh, but this would be an example where a physical precaution that is uh, consciously, there's conscious thought foreseeing what um, uh, implications there might be, and it's implemented into the technology right at the beginning when it's being developed. Uh, other ways that you can um, minimize these negative effects are through some sort of social etiquette, or, um, and we've also had discussion of what role should Congress be playing. Um, our, our goal here is to um, notice that there, are, there certainly is a need to try to foresee what the social effects are, and there's a need to do it at the beginning, while in particular in this case, the lenses are still being developed so that we can make the choice to design them in one direction or another in order to minimize these effects. I recognize at this point that there are difficulties in foreseeing what those things might be. Uh, and here I might want to draw a little bit on, on Heather Douglas, uh, insofar as um, our focus really is on folks like Babak Parvez and the people who are on the ground doing the research with the hope that if they're asking these questions as they're going along, there will be these opportunities to say, wait, wait, I just had a thought. Someone might use this to do blah. Hey, let's think about that. And if, we're, if the mind is open to asking these sort of questions and, and taking responsibility to these sorts of actions, this is the point where, at, right at the beginning of research and development, right where the contact lenses are today, is the point where these sort of implications could be most effective. Um, whether it's possible, I don't know, but at least uh, there's a need for it. And again, just to highlight that these, we're not talking about um, legal obligations here, but really a plea to recognize some sort of moral obligation or social obligation to try to ask these questions. On the other hand, you might uh, wonder, are biotechnology or nanotechnology is going to have these effects? Are these lenses going to have these effects? For example, there are plenty of uh, new technologies or new systems that we use every day that are, that are ubiquitous and yet don't change us, don't force us to change our behavior. Um, we think that gaming, consoles, things like that uh, is a really good example of this. Uh, also, there are all sorts of nanotechnology um, applications. The antibacterial properties that you can throw into your clothing to keep them clean. Um, the cosmetics, all of those are things that might become ubiquitous. They might have other concerns, health and safety concerns, but those kinds of cos putting nanoparticles in cosmetics won't have this sort of societal change that we're worried about. So it's possible that, that the contact lenses also won't have that, that implication that's quite possible. So we want to um, consider that. Uh, yet at the same time, um, what we want to note here is that waiting and seeing what happens isn't feasible, partly for some reasons that we've already seen, and what we're calling irreversibility. So in addition to this notion that society has to adapt to some of these new technologies, there's also this notion that once we've gotten going, it's going to be really hard um, to go back to what we had before. It's going to be really hard to take that technology out. So here we have... Um, some folks very uh, worried about losing their cell phones, having withdrawal symptoms. Um, once we get dependent on these cell phones for communicating for, uh, with one another, to have them suddenly uh, removed can be uh, quite problematic. Even though if we'd never had them in the first place, and this is the key, it wouldn't have been so bad. So uh, one example also that happened earlier this year, um, t t talking about at electricity and how we're all so dependent on electricity right now. Uh, when there was that storm in, in the Midwest earlier this year, there were whole communities that went without power for two weeks and they were completely devastated. They had no, they uh, were in such a state of dependence on this electricity. They had no way to heat their food, heat their houses, uh, see, they, they uh, were quite at a loss, except that they were living right next door to the Amish. I don't know how many of you heard about this, how, this story. And so the neighbor, their Amish neighbors were affected very, very differently by the loss of power due to the storm. And the Amish were getting along just fine. And they invite, invited everyone over and taught them how to light kerosene lamps and build wood stoves. And uh, I think it was a great cultural experience. So this example illustrates two things. One is that if we had never been introduced to that 
uh, new technology in the first place, its removal might not have been so dramatic or so difficult. And also, too, that depending on who you are and what your relationship is with this new technology, removing it will affect you differently. So these two communities had a very different response to the storm. Uh, Another reason for thinking that they might, uh, these technologies might be irreversible in this sense, um, this case was a sudden catastrophic event. It was, it was sudden, it was unexpected. Um, on the other hand, perhaps once we start going on a certain path, um, we get going and it just becomes difficult to replace it with something better even when we have something better in the works. So the example here in the cartoon is a Windows operating system. It's not the greatest operating system in the world, but it's what we had, it's what we developed, and so we've been using it. Now that many better operating systems have been developed, it's very hard to get lots of groups to shift over to the new one. Because it's new, it's unfamiliar, uh, and there are all sorts of problems associated with that, with shifting over to a better system. And so it would have been uh, ideal, better, if we could have, in the cases where it's possible, foresee, look ahead, make all the improvements before we go ahead and ship out this new product, before we go ahead and, and put these biotic contact lenses on the market, really figure out what we want from them, what we don't want them to be able to do, and build that in as much as possible before it goes out. Um, because shifting over to a new system might be pretty difficult. So uh, we're worried that once we introduce some new technology, whether it's good or bad, we're stuck with it, both the good and the bad effects. Um, and maybe we didn't need it in the first place, so we should be really careful when we introduce it. Uh, and uh, it might um, disappear for because we're using up some sort of finite resource, such as fossil fuels. Um, or we just might become dependent on it uh, for some other reason. We do want to note that this is different from a precautionary principle. Precautionary principle is our has to do with concerns about introducing a new technology. At this point, we're talking about irreversibility. We're really concerned about the problems with removing a technology after it's been introduced. Introducing it might be just fine. We might be happy with that. For some reason, we might need to remove it. And at that's the point where there might be a catastrophe. So in the case of biotic contact lenses, in particular, a real danger is if you introduce this to diabetics who before we're getting along fine, not great, but fine. You introduce this great new tool. Now if something happens and we need to remove it, it fails for some reason, that could be life-threatening. That could be extremely dangerous. So it's something to, to worry about. So in conclusion, uh, we are suggesting that at the stage of development, at the stage when technology is first being imp implemented, it really is important, to the extent that it's possible, to be trying to foresee, to be um, anticipating, as people were saying, uh, what possible effects there might be. Not just the health and safety effects, but also just in the way we socially interact. Uh, they might be really great uh, implications, or they might be a little bit hazardous. And we think everybody has a role to play in this, um, but in particular, the people who are on the ground doing the research. Uh, have, as Heather Douglas would say, a particular view on this. And I do want to echo um, the last talk insofar as uh, we absolutely agree. It's not that we have answers here. But what's really important is to be in the stance of asking the questions. Because there is a role of agency here, of a decision. These technologies don't just appear like mushrooms out of nowhere. We're choosing to make them. Uh, and so we want to place that agency back into the people who are making them. Thank you.